K-pop is North Korea's number one export, a great influence on the Western music market through well choreographed movements and catchy lyrics. All with a good beat. That doesn't sound right. Oh, K-pop is South Korea's number one export. Well, there goes my 20 minute analysis of how Kim Jong-un saved the Korean people from the evil that is the McRib. But we can work around that. Bring in that title card. The story will continue after this. Now how did K-pop begin, and how did it get to be this big? Well, lucky for you, I have the answer. I don't know if you'll like it, but since I'm writing this episode's script, I'll assume you will. And just for a clarification, the only interactions I've had of Korea have been with two professors and a friend who graduated a while back, so I'll butcher at least one word per segment. Now this is going to be hard to believe, but K-pop started in Korea of all places. And much like the other genres of today, it has a long and storied history. Which I'm going to simplify to a degree. Let's start this mini documentary off with a second title card. Some of the first non traditional forms of music arrived on the Korean peninsula in the late 1800s thanks to American missionary Henry Appenzeller. He and his fellow missionaries educated the Korean youths in their Christian schools with songs from the West that were called Shanga in Korean. The adaptation of these Western tunes was also picked up by the Japanese government, with them adding more friendly lyrics about national unity with Nihon. The Changa music genre would grow greatly up until the 1920s, which would see the birth of a musical sensation with a Shakespearean end. Probably one of the first true Korean stars, Yum Sin Deok was born in Pyongyang in 1897. By the 1920s, she was studying music in Japan, graduating in 1923, and in 1926 released one of her greatest hits. To the tune of Ivanovici's Waves of the Danube, Saui Chanmi, or Hymn of Death, a song about the eventuality of death, was released. Only later that year would the song hold more meaning, as on a late summer night on a ferry bound for Korea, Yoon Sim Deok and her lover, Kim Woo Jin, leapt over the rail and into the cold water below. After such a death like that, her song would go on to sell more than 100,000 copies, a tragic tale for one of Korea's first musical starlets. Changa music would continue to persist in Japan, being rewritten by the ruling government to act as nationalistic propaganda in their overseas holding. But Korea rebelled. Instead of taking the occupied nation to arms at the hand of a sword, they took it to words, establishing the subgenre of Korean music known as trot. Trot music is known for its repetition and vocal inflections, and is considered to be the Korean answer to Japan's Enko, a more fast paced step up from the classic changas from decades before. But from the 20s until then, the term ilhang changa was more fashionable in usage. Hey, tangent guy here. Uh, there's variations for this genre, and I'm just gonna go off the more historically used terms. Trot music is still around, and has faced its ups and downs, with it currently being in a revival phase, which is amazing considering how the genre lasted through. After World War II, the Korean Peninsula would be divided in half territorially and eventually culturally. In the North, the totalitarian ideals under Juche socialism would attempt to preserve traditional Korean culture while keeping it in line with the views of the allies of the DPRK. And in the South? Well, you'll see. American cultural influence dropped itself in Korea once again. This time with guns! After the neat little skirmish that had no effect on the world aside from giving my granduncle some USAF hats, American forces remained in South Korea. In 1957, the AFKN started broadcasting popular American hits throughout the country, influencing much of the music at the time. Other influences would make their way to Korea, and topped out with the post-war miracles that were happening to the nation, one could see that Korean culture would modernize and forever change the music world. The 60s saw rock and roll arrive in the nation with the group Ad4 being one of the first Korean bands, debuting in 1968. The Korean version of rock and roll was based off of influences like the Beatles, Bob Dylan, and American Jazz. Throughout the 70s, more hippie-based folk music became popular, joining in on the anti-government protests at the time. 
as the Park Administration cracked down on full music, citing these same protests and the commonly associated sex and drugs that comes with rock and roll. Ironically, trot music was also banned, despite being a favorite genre of President Park for being too Japanese. Luckily for the music world, Park Chung-hee was assassinated two months before the decade ended, which gave Korea a chance to embrace foreign music influences once again, this time in. The 1980s saw a re-emergence of rock and roll and popular music. One more of the newer genres to come about was the Korean ballad. Influenced by sentimental ballads and magnificent stadium shakers known as power ballads, the Korean ballad we know came about in the mid-80s. While the genre itself had been around since the 60s, it took to the mainstream that decade, and has emerged with various other genres like trot, rock, and pop to create a quintessentially Korean sound. Through the 1990s, Korean music was influenced again by Western tastes. Hip-hop, Eurodance, and talking social issues helped push many new artists into the spotlight, even if the critics weren't fans. But the musical influences still hold strong to this day, and even won over some of those naysayers. Talent agencies also saw the pop potential with a new type of personality arriving from Japan, the idol. Idol culture came about in Japan itself in the mid-1980s, influenced as well by foreign pop music and celebrity culture. Idols and their groups had to go through intense training to appeal to a mass market. The only differences with the Japanese groups were that the Korean idols were taller, thinner, and considerably cuter, and with the 1992 premiere of Seo Taiji and Boys, did a lot more of the entertainment industry in Korea start working towards idoldom. Can you feel it? The water is rising. I think it's time for the Korean wave. Wave 1, known as Hallyu, started in the 1990s after neighboring countries like China and Japan saw an increase in sales and viewership of Korean drama and music. This explosion would spread to Southeast Asia, with India, Malaysia, and Burma. K-pop itself saw some early success, with a few bands becoming household names by the mid-2000s, which is where the second wave of the Joseon Tsunami hit. The second wave, called Hallyu 2.0, began in 2007 with the help of 21st century technology and the rise of Web 2.0 used to create content such as fan sites and message boards that helped bring people together. They even started to drive more Americans to listen to K-pop. One could see as well that the Korean government joined in on the winning of the hearts and minds of the world, partially funding international K-pop festivals in countries like India and the US. But other countries did strike back. Taiwan, Japan, and China stemmed the influx of Korean cultural exports which only led to the companies behind them to hunt down new markets overseas. Much like with a large enough eruption in the Pacific, waves made their way to the US. <laughs> the third wave, Hallyu 3.0, came about within the last decade, and it's what we're going through right now. Dramas and music hit the shores of more Western countries like Turkey, France, and the US, as well as this wave regaining a foothold in Southeast Asia and losing the status of fad in many of those countries. As of 2020, there are over 104 million fans who are a part of nearly 2,000 clubs. It just goes to show that Korean content is on the rise. And I don't just mean music and dramas. Movies and other television programs are a part of this great big wave. Especially zombie films. South Korea knows what's going on there. But that pretty much sums up the history behind the Korean genre of K-pop. It's stylistic roots sprouting throughout Asia, and even a few from other countries popping up in Korea herself. Here's a few examples. <laughs> probably cover this in a different video. J-pop is one of the more well-known siblings of the pop family. Originating in Japan during the economic boom of the 80s, J-pop is somewhat of an umbrella term. Covering subgenres like city pop, idol pop, and techno pop, the genre exploded in the 90s and continues to grow to this day. C-pop is, much like the PRC's population, too large to cover in one segment. Mostly because it's an umbrella term for all popular music in China. Chinese pop music has become less politicized after the Cultural Revolution, but there is a chance that under the Jinping administration, it will be used more as a propaganda tool. But, since that has not fully happened yet, we can at least experience all the memes. <laughs> Taiwanese pop, better known as Hokkien pop, is a genre of music that originated on the island of Taiwan in the 1930s. The genre saw its ups and downs under the Republic, with it being censored throughout the 60s. But T-pop saw a resurgence in the 80s through 2000s, and Taiwan is now a musical hub of the region. Okay, what even is this? This is the last time I have the cameraman pick the music, aside from that T-pop banger. But enough about other countries. What does Korea have to compete with these outstanding examples? 
The first type of groups is one of the more popular ones. Boy groups are much like the American and European boy band, made entirely out of dudes who sing about loving someone or about money. And from that statement, you can tell I don't know anything about boy bands. Because my 90s guilty pleasure is Eurobeat. Here are a few of the big groups who bring in all the money those boy bands sang about. They're like Boys 12, right? Kinda. BTS is the biggest name a lot of Westerners know when you say K-pop. Debuting in 2013, the Seven Lad group rose to the mainstream a year later. By 2018, BTS grew to be one of the best-selling K-pop boy bands. So me elaborating beyond what is already known is just hyperbole. But only so many people can get so popular to have a McDonald's meal. You may recognize them from the Segway Guy on a history card. Founded in 2006, they've seen success with multiple awards and chart-topping singles. And Big Bang is considered by many to be South Korea's national boy band. Contrary to their name, this group only has 13 members. Originally one of the biggest groups in the industry, it was supposed to have 17 boys, but four left. They are divided into three units, hip-hop, vocals, and entertainment, and are known for having done everything themselves. Living up to their name, they have seven members. Known for quality songs that are self-made, GOT7 is known to top the gown and Billboard's world charts. I couldn't find any more information on them, as I have a deadline in writing. Girl groups are much like boy groups, the only difference being, and they are just as popular both in and out of Korea. Made up of nine girls, twice debuted in 2015. They came about after 16 girls fought each other on live TV to gain a spot in the group. They rose to domestic fame the next year and would see international success and recognition in 2017, after simultaneously topping the world album and world digital sales charts, being the first female Korean act to do such that. A group I somehow know without hearing any of their music. Made up of women from various backgrounds, they've become the highest charting girl group in the genre. Debuting in 2016, Blackpink became the highest charting female Korean act on the Billboard Hot 100. And they're less known for confusing me to the point that I thought Japanese starlet Lisa was part of the group, and not Thai rapper Lisa. Not to be confused with Japanese rapper and producer Lisa. A six-member group made up of various nationalities. They made their debut in 2018, and are one of the first successful groups not hailing from a big free studio. They also write their own music, so if you go by the archetype of the rising star, they're the most successful. I thought this was rarer than it actually is. Mixed groups, or co-ed groups, consisting of boys and girls, act exactly the same as the individual boy and girl groups. So I don't need to explain them any further than the fact that they combine people for a variety of voices. And since I have no way of knowing how successful a lot of these groups are, I just picked free with cool names. Sadly not named after the wrestler, Triple H was a group that was around for two years and two albums. The only reason for the group not existing anymore was the fact that two other members were dating each other, and viewers will be happy to know that these two members have since gotten engaged. Okay. There's another co-ed group that was short-lived. Lasting from 2014 to 2015, and only having two albums, PTS worked more on the hip-hop side of K-pop, using urban influences to create a unique sound when combined with electronica. The only band in the subsection to last longer than a full year, Cool has been around since 1994. As for them lasting this long, it's due to a number of factors, from the steady and fun singing of vocalist Lee Jae-hoon, to catchy lyrics that have made them one of the most recorded groups for karaoke. Cool lives up to their name especially since they've been doing this longer than I've been alive in an industry where the long term rarely works. Largely influenced by Japanese culture, solo idols are somewhat rare to find unless they are or were attached to an idol group. So here's my attempt at showing people who got by without having a squad standing behind them the whole show. Park J. Sung, the first celebrity to ever reach a billion views on YouTube. Unless he were born after 2011, he is best known for the 2012 hit single, Gangnam Style, also known as the song the whole world would play during the end of the world. While he has been active since 2001, Western attention only came his way after this single, during the second Korean wave. Lee ji Eun began her career seven years after Psy, but this actress and singer saw success overseas after her 2011 albums, getting her the image of Korea's little sister, or the girl next door. Nowadays, she's the nation's sweetheart and has received awards for her singing, as well as appearing in countless Korean films. One of two musicians who I had to go to some Korean top 10 site for, 
Juan Ho started performing in 2015 with the first records of his hip-hop career. He worked with boy group Monsta X before going solo in 2020, and he is known for his happy and bright musical style. The other musician from the Top 10 site, Lee Ha Yi began her career in 2012 with her first song charting number one in November for the Gaon Digital Charts. Her career did see more success in 2016, with another album being released and winning more awards. And Lee's career seems to be steadily floating near the top of the pile, with brand endorsements and chart-topping hits. Now there's the big fish. Who out of the thousands of groups and solo artists is the most influential and successful as of writing this script? That's not hard to answer, even if I don't know anything about K-pop. The big fish of course being BTS. From a marketing viewpoint, their success comes from catchy lyrics and an international fan culture that waits with bated breath for every new single or tweet from one of the members. They are a juggernaut in the pop world, taking the last part of the 2010s by storm. That and they did have that McDonald's meal. So success in the west for them. Mioda, I think I worked myself into a hole. Gotta think, gotta think. Oh hey, that guy has a segue. I can use that as a segue into... As you see, with big names comes high ticket prices, merchandise, and album sales. Not to mention the indirect economic benefit to the surrounding businesses like hotels and restaurants when a concert comes to town. The genre itself is a goldmine for revenue, with stuff like t-shirts, product tie-ins, and other reasonable and questionable merchandise items padding the figures of each concert's earnings. It's even put a small bump into the Korean economy. A $12.3 billion estimate for K-pop income in 2019 makes up close to a percentage of the national GDP of the ROK. South Korea is the sixth largest media market in the world, compared to the largest market, the US, who generates $170 billion, making up only 0.81% of its GDP. I'd say that's pretty good for one genre, and a lot of money. Now I know what you're thinking, but how did they get all this money? Sex trafficking? We'll get to that later, but it's a good question. Well, you see, the genre itself became more mainstream to Western audiences with a debut on the Apple iTunes Store in 2009. And while sales in Korea were nominal, 2012 would see the genre make 3.4 billion USD and grow within the rest of the decade. As of 2018, the industry boasted sales revenue of 5.8 billion USD, nearly doubling the value from six years previously. While the sales revenue since then hasn't been uploaded, I do have here the 2020 sales revenue for the big free firms of K-pop. Now, this isn't including promotional tie-ins, which if you know from 2020 to 2021 did seem to bring in a lot just from McDonald's having a themed meal. These statistics only have music sales, and while I couldn't find the sales figures from that one promotion or anything similar, I can confidently say that there is probably a few 10 to 100 million after taxes. I'm thinking I got myself into the wrong industry. I need to get my agent on this. You all should formally meet him. Oi, Barry, come here. Hoi, I'm Barry. I know that already. You're Barry Wicklow. You ask people for their mom's pensions outside the Tesco in Slough. That's right. Do you or your mother have pensions that you are not using? Does your elderly father still collect on your deceased mother's pension? Do you collect excess money from the town council? Listen, Barry. That's great and all. But I have an idea that will make us both a lot of money. Do you know any Koreans? 